Yeah. It looks like it's, <laughs> it's like a really good series. So, Prabhika, can you remind me about how long I should talk? Uh, um, one hour. So, I think it will be not a problem. Uh, it's one hour, yeah, it's and like, uh, yeah. at the end, it is maybe 15 minutes of discussion, like depending really on that how many people are going to ask a question. Okay. Great. Yeah, I will, I will do that. Can you remind me about how long I should talk? Uh, uh, one hour. So, I think it will be not a problem. There was my YouTube live was on that, so the sound was coming like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, in two or three minutes we will just start because people are coming right now. Right. Oh, I can see Eric back as well. Hi, Eric. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> So how many? Uh, now it is 12. I think in one minute we will start, okay? Uh, okay, fine. great. start. Is it fine, Amit? Yeah, okay. sure. Uh, okay. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Wesley Holliday as a speaker in our Logic webinar. He is an associate professor of philosophy and faculty member of the group in Logic and Methodology of Science at University of California, Berkeley. He is the chair of the group in Logic and uh, co-organizer of the Berkeley Stanford Circle in Logic and Philosophy. His research interests lie in formal philosophy and logic, especially modal logic, intuitionistic logic, epistemic logic, and epistemology, logic and natural language, logic and probability, and logic and social choice theory. His recent research includes voting theory and computational social choice. Today, he is going to give a talk on possibilities for probability. As always, I would like to encourage all of you to ask questions uh, whenever you want to. Uh, it's over to you, Professor Holiday. Uh, please come. Thank you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Prabhita. Um, it's a real honor to be here speaking in the seminar. As I was mentioning, I'm sorry I couldn't attend more of these. I would love to. It's a great lineup. Maybe I'll try to get up early again if I have enough espresso in the morning and, and join. Um, yeah, so anyway, great to talk to all of you. I'd like to talk today about uh, possibilities for provability. And this is about two things, uh, provability logic, which many of you have heard about, and then something called possibility semantics, which probably fewer of you have heard about, but I'll try to give you an impression of what that's about today. So my plan is to review provability logic and uh, basic modal logic very quickly. So I'm kind of presupposing some familiarity with, with modal logic, but maybe not provability logic in particular. Uh, then what I'm going to do is a very short crash course on possibility semantics, which is a generalization of the possible world semantics that we're most familiar with for modal logic. After that, I need to talk about uh, what's called modal incompleteness. So it was discovered in the 1970s that Kripke semantics cannot be used to characterize all normal modal logics. Uh, and that led to the development of more general semantics. So by modal incompleteness, I'm going to mean things like what's called Kripke incompleteness. That's, of course, a different sense of incompleteness than incompleteness in the Gödel sense. But that, that sense of incompleteness will also be at issue uh, in the talk. So I'm going to talk about uh, provability logic, three different connections between possibility semantics and provability logic. So connection number one, very famous system in provability logic, bimodal girdle love logic. I'm going to talk about a result about that that came out of work on possibility semantics, and that was in a paper that I co-authored with Tadej Litak. The second connection with provability logic will be 
um, something about the Lindenbaum algebra of piano arithmetic, or more generally extensions of piano arithmetic. And that will be based on a paper that I wrote with one of my students, Yi Feng Ding, uh, that just came out in Advances in Modal Logic. And finally, this is what I really want to make sure I have time to talk about, because this is the actual new stuff that you can't just read online. Um, and that is to bring to provability logic an idea that has been around for a long time in epistemic logic. So in epistemic logic, you reason about the knowledge of different agents. And you could also add to the language of epistemic logic a modality for talking about someone in the group knows a proposition. Someone in the, or someone in the group believes a proposition. And I want to consider adding to provability logic, uh, polymodal provability logic, so you're talking about provability in different formal theories. I'd like to add to that a some theory proves modality, a some theory in the group proves uh, in, the, in the style of, of uh, someone knows in epistemic logic. So that's based on a chapter that I've written, which I would be very happy to share with anybody who happens to be interested, um, called Possibility Semantics for this volume, Research Trends and Contemporary Logic, um, which is hopefully forthcoming maybe in 2021. So that has a complete survey of possibility semantics. So if, if you're interested, that's really probably the place to, to look, and I'd be happy to send that to you. OK, so real quick review of propositional modal logic. So I need to have in this talk a kind of algebraic perspective on uh, modal logic. So I start with what's called a Boolean algebra expansion. So a Boolean algebra expansion is just a pair where B is a Boolean algebra. And then I have a family of operations, which I'm going to write as box I. You know, if we're in epistemic logic, we could talk about the knowledge of different agents. So there's the knowledge operator for this agent, the knowledge operator for that agent. But there are many, many interpretations, as you know, for this box. Could be talking about deontic logic or temporal logic. We're going to talk about provability logic. These uh, operations are just unary operations. Uh, I'm going to conflate the carrier set of the Boolean algebra. I'll call that B, and I'll also call the Boolean algebra itself B. Okay? We have a family of unary operations. You know, you, you could you could do things, binary operations or ternary operations, but in this talk, I'm only going to be talking about unary modalities. Okay. All right. So now, Boolean algebra with operators is one of these Boolean algebra expansions in which each of the operations distributes over finite meets, distributes over all finite meets. That's I'm going to call a Boolean algebra with operators. Now, strictly speaking, the history of this is that the, the diamond operator, which is the dual of the box, you usually call that actually the operator in the Boolean algebra with operators. And then the box is called a dual operator. Um, but I'm going to just call these Boolean algebras with operators, um, even though I um, even though I take the box as the primitive. Okay. All right. So now talking about a formal language, we're going to add to the language of propositional logic. I'm just going to use the same symbol, trusting that no confusion will arise. We add a, a unary sentential connective box I for each of our, our indices I. Okay. And I should have put this on the slide, but we can interpret the propositional language with these extra connectives in a Boolean algebra expansion in the obvious way. That is, a valuation on the Boolean algebra expansion assigns an element of the algebra to every propositional variable in the formal language. Right? And then we recursively define a semantic value for every complex formula of the propositional modal language in the obvious way, using the operations of the Boolean algebra and using these operations to interpret the uh, modality box. Okay. Then we say that a formula of the formal language is valid in an algebra if for any valuation on the algebra, for any way of interpreting the propositional variables of the language, your formula should evaluate to top, to the top element of the algebra. Okay. Well, there's an easy idea of what it means for a formula to be valid in a Boolean algebra expansion. It just means under any valuation, 
for the propositional variables of the language, the formula evaluates to the top element of the algebra. Okay, so that's basic algebraic semantics for modal logic. Now, thinking about proof theory, um, these Boolean algebra expansions, they provide algebraic semantics for what's called classical modal logics. Now, a classical modal logic, it's a set of modal formulas that contains all propositional tautologies, just of classical logic here. It's closed under modus ponens, uniform substitution, and then this congruence rule. Congruence rule says that if you can derive as a theorem of the logic, phi if and only if psi, then you can derive box phi if and only if box psi. So that's our basic starting point, and we'll, we'll build on top of that and add extra axioms. So in particular, what we'll do is with normal modal logics, that's the what Boolean algebras with operators uh, provide semantics for. So these BAOs provide semantics for normal modal logics. And there we also have, reflecting the idea of distributivity over finite meets, we have these two additional axioms, box top. So if you have an epistemic interpretation, you know, you know that the tautology is true and uh, your knowledge distributes over conjunction. We're gonna be talking about provability. So it's gonna be that if you can prove a, a conjunction, you can prove a conjunction if and only if you can prove both of the conjuncts. Okay. So that's the basic um, algebraic setup and syntactic setup and proof theoretic setup that we're gonna be building on. Okay. Now the idea here uh, is to interpret box as provability in a formal system. Like for example, piano arithmetic. Okay, so go back to your first logic courses, you know, about uh, formal arithmetic and girdle. I have fond memories of those courses. Um, and we're gonna interpret box as uh, arithmetized provability in, in let's say piano arithmetic. So the logic that um, is the most famous in provability logic is girdle love logic. We can define it as the smallest normal modal logic. I say unimodal here, because it just has a single modality. The smallest normal unimodal logic containing this beautiful Loeb axiom, which you're probably familiar with, right? So if you can prove that the provability of P implies P, then it turns out P must be provable. That's the famous, there's a famous Love theorem, right? And you know, if you recall that if you substitute uh, bottom for P, then you get the second incompleteness theorem, right? So, I mean, here, you know, you would get Box, box bottom implies bottom, but that's just not box bottom. So this says that if you can prove, right, you're consistent, then you must be inconsistent. It's the famous uh, second incompleteness theorem in this beautifully simple modal rendition, okay? Now you can also uh, derive in GL, girdle love logic, all of the famous Hilbert Bernays uh, derivability conditions. I could have defined a normal modal logic in terms of these two uh, principles. The principle of necessitation, if phi is a theorem of the logic, then box phi is a theorem of the logic. And then the K axiom, right? That if you can prove an implication and you can prove the antecedent, then you can prove the consequent, okay? And it's, it's doable, although it's non-trivial to prove that the, this four axiom, if you can prove something, then you can prove that you can prove it Turns out that's actually derivable. You don't need to add that as a basic axiom of the system. Okay, good. Now we can give an arithmetic interpretation for this modal language. So we'll say that a realization is a function f that maps each propositional variable of the modal language to a sentence of formal arithmetic. And then we will recursively extend f to this function f hat that maps every modal formula, including formulas with box, to an arithmetic sentence. You know, it commutes with the Boolean connectives in the obvious way, so you don't, you don't change those at all. But the point is that you interpret box as the arithmetized provability predicate in piano arithmetic. Okay, so box phi is translated to, you know, the, you know here's the girdle number notation. I'm translating uh, phi, finding its girdle number, and then applying the arithmetized provability predicate of piano arithmetic to that girdle number. 
So that, that means we can really, under this interpretation, you can really read box phi as phi is provable in PA, whatever phi happens to stand for. And the famous theorem in the, in the, that, in the field, the most famous theorem in the field, is due to Solovey, uh, arithmetic soundness and completeness, which says that for all modal formulas phi, phi is a theorem of Gödel-Lubb logic if and only if for any way of interpreting the propositional variables as sentences of arithmetic and box as provability, that is for all realizations, PA proves the uh, realization of the formula. Okay. So this is telling you, it's pretty remarkable, that that very elegant, simple system, Gödel-Lubb logic, is capturing exactly the universal reasoning principles for provability in piano arithmetic. Okay, it's a really amazing theorem, and it was proved using the Kripke semantics for Gödel-Lubb logic that I will describe on the next slide. Okay. So what is Kripke semantics? Well, a Kripke frame is a very simple object. It's just a set, non-empty set W, and a binary relation R on the set, okay? And such a Kripke frame gives rise to a Boolean algebra with operators. So the Boolean algebra is just the power set of W. That's your Boolean algebra of propositions. And then how do you define your box? Well, this is the familiar clause from Kripke semantics, uh, which says that at a world W, box Z is true, Z is some proposition. Box Z is true at W, just in case for all successors of W, V, V makes Z true. Okay. Here I put it in this uh, non-syntactic way, just thinking about the algebra that it, that it gives rise to. But this is just the standard modal clause. Box phi is true at W, if for all successors of W, phi is true there, okay? So that is the dual Boolean algebra of operators for a given Kripke frame. And what I'm gonna say is that a logic L is the logic of a class of Kripke frames, uh, if and only if L is the logic of the class of dual Boolean algebras with operators. So I already told you about algebraic semantics. So now you know, about Kripke semantics instantly, because Kripke semantics just gives you a, a way of generating Boolean algebras with operators. Okay, you take the power set of a set, and then you induce the box on the power set using the binary relation um, and this definition. Okay, and then validity means the, the normal thing that it always means for any way of interpreting the propositional variables in the power set, uh, your formula is going to evaluate to the whole set, meaning that it's true in all possible worlds, right? So the normal notion of, of frame validity in Kripke semantics says for the frame, however you interpret the propositional variables as subsets of the frame, when you then calculate the semantic value of the formula, it's true at all worlds in that model on the frame, okay? All right, now the thing that was used in the proof of Solovey's theorem was this, um, Kripke completeness result for GL, which can be stated like this, that girdle love logic is the logic of the class of Kripke frames that are finite transitive irreflexive trees. So if, you, if, a, if a formula is not provable in girdle love logic, you know that it's refuted on a frame with some valuation, and the frame is very nice. It's a finite <laughs> transitive irreflexive tree Having that much information about how you can refute a formula is very useful in then proving the arithmetic completeness theorem. So this was a great success of Kripke semantics in proving something, the arithmetic completeness theorem that has nothing to do with Kripke semantics, right? That's just the theorem about the arithmetic interpretation of brutal love logic. Okay, so good. I did my review of provability logic. Now I need to do the crash course on possibility semantics. So the basic, in one slide, very abstractly, <laughs> I'm going to explain the key difference between possible world semantics and possibility semantics. So possible, oh, I should say, this comes, my own involvement in this and also its, its chronology starts in 1981. I mean, there were definitely related earlier things, but at least the way I got into this was reading a great paper by Lloyd Humberstone called From Worlds to Possibilities, 
which came out in the Journal of Philosophical Logic, and I recommend taking a look at that paper. Okay, but here's in one slide, the essential contrast. So in classical possible world semantics, of which Kripke semantics is an is a example, um, we use the following Boolean algebras. First, the power set algebra of a set, okay? Those give you complete and atomic Boolean algebras. And then that's sort of for the discrete duality in possible world semantics. For the topological duality, we look at the algebra of Clopin sets of a stone space. And there you can pick up arbitrary Boolean algebras. Now, the, the contrast is that in possibility semantics, we don't look at those. We look instead at, number one, the regular open algebra of a partially ordered set. And I'm going to describe on the next slide or review what that is. But instead of looking at a power set of a, of a set, a flat set, instead of doing that, we look at the regular open algebra of a Po set. So we add a partial order to the set. So we have more structure. Okay, I'm gonna explain this on the next slide. And then, although it's not important for this talk, I can't resist mentioning it, that there's also an analog to this uh, algebra of Clopin sets of a stone space, and that's the algebra of compact regular open sets of what we call a UV space, upper via torus space. Okay, and if you're interested in topology and duality theory, then you can uh, Google choice-free stone duality and you'll get our paper that tells you what an upper via torus space is. So here's the key point. Um, if you do this Kripke approach, looking at the power set of a set, you only pick up complete and atomic Boolean algebras. So you're, you're quite restricted to only be able to generate atomic Boolean algebras. Whereas with this possibility semantics approach, with the regular open algebra of a Po set, you can pick up all complete Boolean algebras. You don't have to restrict yourself to atomic ones. And that's going to be an essential point in this talk, that we can get away from atomicity. As an aside, the key distinction in the, at the level of topological duality is that uh, the traditional stone duality requires non-constructive choice principles. You need ultra filters. Uh, whereas the possibility semantic analog of stone duality you can do choice free. You can just do it in ZF set theory. So if you're interested in questions about choice or you're interested in point free topology, constructive math, then you might be interested in this uh, choice free stone duality. I'm not gonna talk about that today though. Okay, let me remind you first about the regular open algebra of an arbitrary topological space. So the regular open sets of a space are those opens U such that U is equal to the interior of its closure. Okay, that's a regular open set. And Stone and Tarski realized that the family of all regular open sets ordered by inclusion forms a complete Boolean algebra. And here are the operations. Instead of taking set theoretic complement, which is what we would normally do if we're looking at the power set, we take interior of set theoretic complement. Okay? Instead of taking intersection, like we would normally do, we take interior of intersection. And here's the really important part. Instead of just taking the union, we take interior of the closure of the union. We need to regularize the union. If you have two regular open sets and you look at their union, that's not necessarily regular open. So you need to regularize it by applying interior closure to the union. So that's the topological notion of a regular open set and regular open algebra. And any complete Boolean algebra actually arises as the regular open uh, set of a space, in particular an Alexandrov space, um, in which case we don't need to worry about this interior over the intersection. We can just think about meet as, as intersection. Now, what I mean by Alexandrov space, you can just think about that as it's the regular opens in the downset topology on a post set. So I'm really not going to be thinking about arbitrary spaces here. I'm going to be thinking about partially ordered sets. So I have a partially ordered set, I'm going to call S the set of possibilities. And this relation, we call the relation of refinement. So here's the key idea. Possibilities, unlike possible worlds, are partial. Some possibilities can be more specific and contain more information than others. So I can just consider you know, the possibility that right now it's raining in Los Angeles. That's a possibility that doesn't settle all kinds of other things, like the, what, what is the weather right now? in San Francisco. 
right? So unlike a possible world, which gives a truth value to every formula of your language, a possibility may just decide a few questions and leave many other questions unanswered. But these possibilities can be refined. They can be made more specific. Now, the way I read this, I read something like x under y. Um, that means that x is a refinement. I didn't read that very well, sorry. Um, x is a refinement of y. So x contains all the information that y does and maybe more. So I go down in my post set to get more specific. Some people like to go up in their post sets to get more specific. If you read a lot of the literature on intuitionistic Kripke semantics, which this is very related to, people like to go up and think about upsets. But I, here I'm going down. This is more in line with, with forcing and set theory. And forcing and set theory is very closely related to everything I'm saying here. Uh, so I'm going to go down in my post set to get more specific. Okay. And to say that a set is regular open, so I want to know if I have a set of possibilities that are ordered by this refinement relation, what should I call propositions? And a proposition should have two properties. It should be downward closed. So that's the persistence condition. That if a possibility X makes a proposition U true, and Y is a more refined possibility than X, well, then Y is also going to make U true. Okay, so once a possibility makes something true, like the possibility that it's raining in Los Angeles, then any refinement of that possibility will also make true that it's raining in Los Angeles, but maybe more stuff will become true. Okay. So that's familiar if you've seen intuitionistic Kripke semantics, but now I need to add something that's not like intuitionistic Kripke semantics, refinability. Refinability says that if a possibility does not make a proposition U true, then that possibility can be refined to a possibility that makes U false. That is, that makes the negation true. So that is the key way in which we're going to get classical logic. Classical logic, not just intuitionistic logic, is by adding this requirement of refinability. Okay. Now, not U here, let me remind you what not U is. Uh, it's implicit from the previous slide, but the negation of a proposition. So a possibility X makes the negation of U true just in case all refinements of X do not make U true. So that's the standard clause from intuitionistic Kripke semantics, right? You force not phi at some state just in case none of your successors force phi. Okay, so, so refinability then means that if X does not make U true, then there is a refinement of X that makes the negation true, which is to say that none of Y's successors make U true. Okay. All right, so if a set satisfies both persistence and refinability, then we call it a regular open set. And that's just a regular open set in the downset topology on the post set, the topology where the open sets consist of all the downward closed sets. But Let's, we can just think in terms of persistence and refinability. Those are the two conditions that a set must meet in order for we, us to call it a proposition. Okay. Now we get a Boolean algebra, which I'll write like this, the regular open algebra of the post set. And it's pretty easy to think about, at least for me at this stage. So, you know, as I said, negation is not just set theoretic complement. Negation is like this intuitionistic negation. None of my refinements make the proposition true. Um, conjunction or meet is just intersection. So that's pretty easy to think about. Add a possibility, you make a conjunction true just in case you make both of the conjuncts true. And finally, though, you do have to think a little bit differently about disjunction. And this is important. So to make a disjunction true at a possibility, you don't already have to choose one of the disjuncts. That's a big difference between intuitionistic Kripke semantics, which requires if you force a disjunction, you have to either force the left disjunct or the right disjunct. Instead, in possibility semantics, to force a disjunction, it's got to be true just that for any refinement of the current possibility, there's a further refinement that forces one of the disjuncts. So this quantifier pattern is extremely important in possibility semantics. You see it everywhere. This for all exists quantifier pattern. So for a disjunction, 
to make phi or psi true, now thinking a little more logically, at a possibility, I don't have to make phi true. I don't have to make psi true. But I have to kind of co-finally make the decision. So it has to be that for any successor, for any refinement, I can then push to a further refinement that will settle one of the disjuncts. Okay, so I don't have to choose now. Remember, it's very important. If you think about these possibilities as information states, of course, you can be in an information state where you know a disjunction without knowing which disjunct is true, right? That's a very familiar thing. So why require that uh, a possibility in order to make a disjunction true, you've got to already know which disjunct it is. Now that's a very intuitionistic way of thinking that you know, if you're going to assert a disjunction, you better be prepared to assert which disjunct it is. But from a classical point of view, uh, we can know a disjunction without knowing which disjunct it is. As long as for any refinement, we could, we could do some more research and, and get one of the uh, disjuncts. OK. So now I want to give possibility semantics. That was basically possibility semantics for classical propositional logic, because it showed you how to get a Boolean algebra. Um, and indeed, I should have mentioned, you know, any Boolean algebra, any complete Boolean algebra arises in this way. You just take your Boolean algebra, delete the bottom element of your Boolean algebra, and let that restricted order coming from the lattice order of the Boolean algebra, let that be your partial order. That then will be a poset whose regular open algebra is isomorphic to your original complete Boolean algebra. I see there's a question, thanks. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, so in the specific case where uh, the partial order is equality, do we yes. get uh, the world, uh, you know, possible world semantics? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. Where this is just the equality relation, then, um, Every subset is regular open, yeah. and it's the power set algebra. Okay. Thank so, you. So we get back the possible world semantics. Get back the possible world semantics. Thank you. That's a super, super important point. I really appreciate that, yeah. OK, so to give a, a semantics for modal logic, we do the obvious thing, which is that we add accessibility relations to our post set. OK, we add accessibility relations to our post set. And then we interpret box in the usual way. So a possibility X is going to make box Z true, just in case all success, all, all accessible possibilities from X uh, make Z true. So standard interpretation of box that you're familiar with from Kripke semantics, we, we apply that in possibility semantics as well. OK, now we do have a little subtlety, which is that Propositions for us must be regular open sets. They must satisfy persistence and this refinability condition. So we do need to guarantee that if Z is regular open, so is box Z. And for that, we need some interaction conditions between the accessibility relations for the modality and the refinement relation that we use to interpret the uh, Boolean connectives. Okay. This is very much like intuitionistic modal logic, if you've ever seen that. Intuitionistic modal logic also has a partial order and accessibility relations for the modalities. And you have to impose some constraints on the interaction in order to get that modal formulas are also persistent, that the interpretation of a modal formula is, down, is downward closed. So I don't want to get bogged down in the details, but I'll just flash up some pictures. These interaction conditions are very nice, I claim. Very easy to think about. Um, oh, before I say that, what is the Boolean algebra of op with operators that we're going to get from a possibility frame? That's what we're going to call these things, possibility frames. Uh, well, it's the regular open algebra together with these operations, which I need to convince you will send any regular open set to a regular open set. And that, that tells you then immediately what possibility semantics is. It's uh, algebraic semantics where you, where you generate the Boolean algebra with operators in this way. OK, so I'm just going to flash some pictures up. I'm not really going to explain them too much for the sake of time. But you have two interaction conditions on the partial order and the accessibility relation. Here, the accessibility relation is the dashed line. Um, for instance, to, to, get, to get that box formulas are persistent, um, that's what this condition does. 
which says that if you're at a possibility X and you refine it to Y, and then Y takes an X, uh, sorry, you refine it to X prime, and then X prime takes an accessibility step to Y prime, then you already had to be able to take an accessibility step from X to Y prime. That actually helps you guarantee that if a box formula is true at X, it's still true at X prime. Basically, if you know what you want to do is, well, if, if box phi were not true at X prime, then that would be because there's some accessible possibility where phi is not true. But then by this condition, that possibility would have already been accessible from X. And so box phi would not be true at X. Just to give you a sense of how these conditions come into play. OK, I'm not going to explain R down, but that's a nice condition that can be used uh, assumed without loss of generality. Also, yeah, comes up in the definition of an intuitionistic modal frame. What sets possibility frames apart from intuitionistic modal frames is this condition of refinability. Because remember, we, we want the modal formulas to satisfy this refinability principle, which says that if at a possibility x, um, box phi is not true, then there should be refinement uh, x prime of x at which box phi is false. That is not box phi is true. And this interaction condition is what guarantees this. Um, and I don't think I'll explain it too much, but I'll just mention as an aside, there's a nice game theoretic interpretation of these interaction conditions where the two players are arguing about whether x should be accessible or y should be accessible from x. So these, that condition might look a little bit intimidating, but uh, I claim it's actually, there's a nice game theoretic way to think about it. Okay, now the three conditions I just gave are jointly sufficient to guarantee that if Z is a regular open set, so is box Z. So there we get a nice Boolean algebra with operators. Now these are not the necessary and sufficient conditions. You, uh, you know, you, I can send you one of my papers that says exactly what the necessary and sufficient conditions are, but these nice elegant conditions can be assumed without loss of generality. So let's just pretend that these are the conditions that we have on our the interaction between accessibility and refinement. So we just added one condition to an intuitionistic modal frame. So what is a possibility frame then? Um, I, the, the word full there is to distinguish these possibility frames from something called general possibility frames, but I just won't pronounce the full most of the time. Uh, so we have a post set and we have a family of binary relations that have to guarantee that if Z is regular open, box Z is regular open. And we can assume that we take care of that using those three interaction conditions that I just gave. Okay. So that in a nutshell is possibility semantics for modal logic. Is it more general than Kripke semantics? Yes, it is. This is closely related to uh, algebraic incompleteness result of Tadeusz Litak. But what we can prove is that there are continuum many unimodal logics that are Kripke incomplete, but full possibility frame complete. So this is a general, this is a genuine generalization of Kripke semantics. I'm going to come back to that point. So now very quickly, I'll just say, just if you've done modal logic, you know there's a notion of general frame where you add to a Kripke frame a distinguished subalgebra of the Boolean algebra with operators that's dual to the Kripke frame. Let me just say briefly, you can do the exact same thing with possibility semantics, and that gives you a general possibility frame. And I'm not going to go into too many details on that. I do need one term just so I can say the theorem later. Uh, a principal possibility frame is a general possibility frame. So a general possibility frame has a distinguished subalgebra of the full regular open algebra. And you only allow your propositional variables to be interpreted in the distinguished subalgebra. A principal possibility frame is one of these general possibility frames in which um, P, the set of admissible propositions, is exactly the set of all principal downsets in the post set. So a principal downset means you take a possibility and then everything that's below that. That's a principal downset. Okay. I can't get into details of too much of this, but I'm going to state a theorem later in terms of principal possibility frames. So, to be honest in, in my exposition, I wanted to at least flash up the definition. Okay, final thing I need to say is that just as Kripke frames get generalized to neighborhood frames 
And Eric has written a very nice textbook about uh, neighborhood semantics that you should all check out. So just as you can do that, going from Kripke frames to neighborhood frames, you can also go from possibility frames to neighborhood possibility frames. So what is the neighborhood idea? Instead of an accessibility relation, you have this neighborhood function um, that assigns to every world a family of propositions. It assigns to every world a family of propositions. And then box, what's the interpretation of box? Well, box Z is true at W, just in case Z belongs to that family of distinguished propositions. So that's an ordinary neighborhood frame. You do the exact same thing with with a neighborhood possibility frame, you replace the accessibility relations by the neighborhood functions. Um, all the only thing we need to make sure of is that um, if Z is a regular open set, then box Z is a regular open set. And box is the same interpretation, it's just that W is now a possibility. So box Z is true at a possibility just in case Z belongs to N of that possibility. And so to ensure that whenever Z is regular open, box Z is regular open, we, we again need persistence and refinability assumptions. So persistence just means, you know, if something is necessary at X and X prime is a refinement, then that proposition is also necessary at X prime. And uh, an obvious statement of, of what refinability would mean for the neighborhood functions. That's just to say that the standard theory of general frames and neighborhood frames generalizes very naturally to the possibility semantic setting. Okay, good. I made it through my crash course. <laughs> I got to speed up a little bit. So what is Kripke incompleteness? It's the phenomenon that um, Kripke frames cannot be used to characterize all normal modal logics. And this was discovered by uh, several people in the 70s. Um, simple examples were also found. Oh yeah, question, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Um, when you generalize this way, the, yeah. the partial order and the accessibility relation can start interacting, right? Yes. And uh, how do we, you know, are there some uh, good characterizations of particular interactions or, I mean, if they don't interact at all, you're not going to get that much out of this generalization, right? Or do we, I mean, I'm, it's just a, Yes, so we have these three conditions um, on the interaction of the partial order and the accessibility relation. Okay. Um, and these are the ones that guarantee that whenever... Yeah. Okay. So, so the closure this particular closure condition is the only one that you really need. Okay. Yeah, these are actually stronger than what you need. Um, you can get by with even weaker conditions, but these conditions and even, even stronger ones can be assumed without loss of generality. And what I mean by assume that loss of generality is that um, any possibility frame can be converted into one satisfying these conditions and more um, that gives you the same Boolean algebra with operators. Uh, yeah. One more, if you don't mind. Yeah, there is this uh, theorem by Thomason uh, characterizing modal algebras and p morphisms. Yes. Uh, is there a gen you know a similar one uh, for? the algebraic characterization that you're talking about as well? Or yes, yes. That, that's absolutely right. Yeah, so Thomason did this uh, dual equivalence between the category of Kripke frames yes. with two morphisms and then complete anatomic uh, Boolean algebras with completely multiplicative box operators and then complete modal algebra homomorphisms. We have an exact analog of that for possibility semantics. So. Okay. In this paper I have called possibility frames and forcing for modal logic, there's a duality theorem that's analogous to that, categorical duality. But it's, uh, you drop atomicity from the, uh, that, the algebra, the dual algebras. Yeah. Thank Thanks. You. That's a really good question. That's very related to actually what I'm about to talk about. So, so Kripke incompleteness, there are, yeah, there are modal logics syntactically defined like I did earlier, normal modal logics, which are not the logic of any class of Kripke frames. And um, you know, at first it started with kind of contrived examples, but then the examples got simpler and closer to real logics. Um, a very natural example was um, the logic of the Henkin sentence. So Henkin asked a question uh, that was closely related to Loeb's theorem. And it turned out that the modal logic 
the smallest normal unimodal logic containing this Henkin formula uh, turned out to be uh, Kripke incomplete. So that's a very simple, natural example of a Kripke incomplete unimodal logic. And shortly, we're going to see a bimodal uh, example, a very natural example of a Kripke incomplete logic. OK. Now, the algebraic uh, perspective on, of, on incompleteness is we need to ask, what are the properties of the dual algebra of a Kripke frame that are responsible for the incompleteness of a given logic? So what are the characteristic features of the duals of Kripke frames? Well, we get an atomic Boolean algebra. So let's say that an ABAE is a BAE whose Boolean reduct is atomic. Let's say that a CBAE is a uh, BAE whose Boolean reduct is a complete Boolean algebra. And we'll say that a v, VBAO, it's a BAO where the diamond operator distributes not only over finite joins. I should have said that just as the box distributes over finite meets, the diamond in a BAO distributes over finite joins. This diamond distributes over any existing joins in a, in a VBAO. V is supposed to suggest big V, big join. Any joins that exist, the diamond distributes over those joins. So that's a VBAO. Of course, I've been thinking in terms of box in this talk. So that means the box distributes over any existing meets. So these three properties are the properties of uh, the duals of Kripke frames. And this is the, goes back to this categorical equivalence that I just mentioned. There's a categorical equivalence between these kind of BAOs with complete uh, homomorphisms on the one hand, and then Kripke frames with p-morphisms on the other. So we can ask which of these properties, or maybe their combination, is really responsible for a given case of Kripke incompleteness. What is it that this logic doesn't like about Kripke frames? Maybe it doesn't like the completeness of the Kripke frame, or it doesn't like the atomicity of the Kripke frame. So this is a program that, well, Tadeusz Litek uh, laid out in his dissertation, but I mean, lots of people have been um, interested in this algebraic view of incompleteness. Um, so from this perspective, Kripke incompleteness is the same as incompleteness with respect to BAOs that are complete atomic and the box is completely multiplicative. And so what people did is they tried to see, well, can, can incompleteness arrive just because of one of these properties? Edovenema showed that, yes, atomicity by itself can lead to incompleteness. So there are logics which cannot be characterized as the logic of a, of a class of atomic Boolean algebras with operators. So atomicity loses generality in, character, in characterizing modal logics. Um, Litak showed that the same is true for completeness. There are logics that cannot be characterized by um, a class of complete Boolean algebra with operators. Now, the question then arose naturally after those two theorems, are there any logics that are not the logic of any class of um, operator of Boolean algebra with, with operators where box distributes over arbitrary uh, existing meets? Right? So are there any V incomplete logics? And as I look at the time, I, I realize I have to go quickly through this part of the story because you can read about it online. So I want to get to the new stuff in my last 10 minutes. Um, but the answer is yes. The, the famous bimodal provability logic, uh, GLB, very briefly, you have two modalities. One of them stands for provability in piano arithmetic. The other stands for provability in piano arithmetic with one application of the omega rule, right? which says that if you prove phi of 0, phi of 1, phi of 2, phi of, phi of 3 for every natural number, then you can prove for, for all x, phi of x. That's the omega rule. Um, anyway, there's a beautiful bimodal provability logic for reasoning about provability in these two theories. And it turns out using the machinery of possibility semantics, that led to an answer to this open problem about modal incompleteness. And we were able to show that the, the bimodal girdle love logic is not the logic of any class of VBAOs. That settled this open question about modal incompleteness. And the proof essentially relies on the fact that you can turn, this is how, how the, the theorem was discovered, 
that you can turn every VBAO into a possibility frame and you can think about an accessibility relation. So box distributing over arbitrary meets, that allows you to have an accessibility relation, even if you don't assume atomicity. So relational semantics doesn't need worlds. <laughs> There's something more fundamental about relational semantics for modal logic. Uh, and it really has to do with the complete multiplicativity of the box. It doesn't have to do with the possible worlds. And it turns out that's what GLB actually doesn't like. It doesn't like that you're trying to give relational semantics for it, in essence. So you can read about this uh, online. So I want to get to some of the new material. Um, you can also read about provability part two online. So let me go very quickly through that. Um, A incompleteness. Sometimes atomicity is to blame for the incompleteness of a logic. And I'll just flash up what this um, formula is because I think it's very easy to understand. Here's a formula that, well, it has an arithmetic interpretation, but I think you can just understand it epistemically or, or in lots of other ways. This says that if P is true, then for all I know, maybe that's an epistemic modality. And for all I know, we could have P together with P having property Q, but also for all I know, we could have P together with P not having property Q. I mean, I don't know much about this Q. <laughs> so it could go either way for me. Now, um, this can never be true in possible world semantics. This can never be valid, I should say, on a possibility frame, a uh, possible world frame. This can never be valid on a possible world frame. Why is that? Just interpret P as the singleton set of a world. Or algebraically, interpret P as an atom, right? Well. It can't be then that there's some world where you have P with property Q and there's another world where you have P with property not Q. You can't split a world in half. If you interpret P as the singleton set of a world, well then, you, you know, you can't cut a world in half and have half of the world satisfying QP and the other half satisfying not QP. So this is never gonna be valid uh, in, a, in a possible world frame because I can interpret P as a world. Okay, that's a big problem. But um, you can easily handle this impossibility semantics. In fact, you can give complete logics based on a principle like this. And the idea is very simple. Impossibility semantics, things can just be refined forever. <laughs> so you can give us very simple possibility frame based on the full infinite binary tree. Um, I won't go through the details. It's not hard to define a neighborhood function that validates this principle which basically just has the consequence that if P is true, well, I can always refine to a, a world where, you know, I have P and I also have QP, but I could also refine to some place where I have P and I have not QP, something like that. And you can just keep doing that forever for every proposition. So in the full infinite binary tree, every proposition can be further, you know, you, you, if you find a point where the proposition is true, well, you have two successors, two children, two refinements. So you can keep splitting propositions forever in a possibility frame. You can't keep splitting propositions forever in a possible world frame. Okay, so that all works. This has an arithmetic interpretation, which I just have to gloss over, but it's a very interesting arithmetic interpretation due to Shabrakov and Visser. And uh, in the paper, another problem in possible world semantics, which I'll flash up at the end, um, this is all explained. So I think I'm gonna just skip to my my third and final uh, thing, which I really wanted to talk about, which is that provability logic with someone knows. Very simple idea. I'm gonna be in a polymodal provability logic setting. So I have lots of formal theories that I'm reasoning about, not just PA, but I could be reasoning about lots of other formal theories. I have a group of theories. I wanna be able to talk about some theory in the group can prove phi. This is gonna allow me to talk a bit about Godelian uh, inexhaustibility, okay? So what is the standard semantics or a standard semantics for this language like an epistemic logic? Well, what we would do is we would have a Kripke frame and then if we wanted to do like varying agent domain models, like you do, you know, varying domain models and like uh, quantified modal logic, you'd assign to every world some non-empty set of agents who are the agents who belong to the group at that world. That way you can be uncertain about who belongs to the group. Um, and then what you'd say is, 
someone believes phi at w, just in case there is somebody in the group at w uh, who believes phi. It's the obvious semantics for someone believes. And we can do the exact same thing in possibility semantics. But again, we got to be a little careful. We, we need to make sure that this group uh, function satisfies persistence and refinability. So that if you're a member of a group at x, if, if the possibility x settles that you're a member of the group, then the refinement also needs to settle that you're a member of the group. And you also have a refinability condition. Then the other subtlety is that in possibility semantics, whenever we're dealing with disjunction or existentials, we need this for all exists quantifier pattern out in front. So that's just across the board whenever you have a disjunction or an existential. So someone believes phi is true to possibility x, you don't have to pick the witness already at x. It just needs to be that for any refinement, there's a further refinement such that you get a witness, somebody who believes phi. Okay, so that's the basic setup. It's just like an epistemic logic, but I want to apply it to provability logic. And now I get to maybe my most important slide, sort of conceptually, which is the Godelian problem with possible worlds. Here's the problem. Possible world semantics commits us to the idea that if every truth is known or proved by someone or other, which we would formalize by this axiom, if P is true, then someone believes P, or someone knows P. Possibility semantics says that if every truth is known by someone, then there's some one person who knows all the truths. I just want to pause, let that sink in. Why is that? That's because for a given world, just consider this true world proposition, the singleton of W. Well, the agent who knows that proposition knows all truths. I mean, assuming monotonicity, so, you know. <laughs> If they know the singleton of W, they know any true proposition. Now, that's already a bit surprising, epistemologically speaking. Now, as I'm putting my philosopher hat on, <laughs> the idea, why, why should, you, if you think every truth is known by someone or other, why should you think there's someone who knows all truths? Well, because possible world semantics thinks there's these very special truths, world propositions, right, that entail all other truths. Okay. But what's the, problem of, from, what's the problem with that from the Gödel point of view? Well, the second incompleteness theorem entails for the theories that it covers that if a single theory can prove every truth, then that theory is inconsistent, right? Think about extensions, recursive extensions of, uh, recursively enumerable extensions of uh, piano arithmetic, okay? Uh, re recursive extensions, the, the axioms need to be computable, right? Uh, think about those extensions of PA. Right? Second incompleteness theorem. So these things can't prove every truth or else they're inconsistent. Right? Um, so that would mean that in the class, we would have to have an inconsistent theory. So possible world semantics is committing us to saying that if we have a class of theories, and in that class, uh, whenever something is true, there's some theory or other in the class that proves it, then possible world semantics commits us to there being an inconsistent theory in the class. Okay, so if every truth is provable in um, some theory or other in a class, then the class contains an inconsistent theory. But we know from Gödel that this is not so for every class of theories. So we have a big problem on our hands. Now this can be formalized. The argument, I just gave a little informal sketch. This can be formalized. The, the idea that if you're in you don't even have to be in Kripke frames, just in neighborhood frames, but it's, a, it's important that this is a possible world frame. If you're in a possible world frame and it validates every truth is known by someone or other, it val validates monotonicity, and it validates the second incompleteness theorem, then some agent in the group is inconsistent. Okay? And the basic idea, I won't go through the proof, is to evaluate P as a singleton set of a world. If you evaluate P as a singleton set of a world, then the witness to S of P, right? They know that singleton proposition, but then they're omniscient, and that contradicts the second incompleteness theorem. I'm happy to walk through the proof if anybody um, wants to see it in, in Q and A, but I better get to my punchline here. Okay, good news, good news, everybody. This is not the case with possibility semantics. So there are simple 
full possibility frames that validate for every truth, it's proved by some theory or other, and validate Gödel love logic for every uh, agent, and do not validate someone is uh, inconsistent. So this allows us to have the Godelian picture that every truth can be proved by some theory or other without committing ourselves to there being some inconsistent theory. Okay, and I'll just show a picture real fast. I won't explain it, but again, you, you use a tree, uh, a tree where every node has at least two successors. So things get refined forever and you just need to define accessibility relations on the tree appropriately um, so that you validate Gödel love logic. Okay, so if anybody wants to, to hear about the details of that, I, I can explain that. But what we get then is this contrast that the possible world framework does not allow us to say what we want to say based on Gödel because of the existence of these limit points. I mean, the whole idea of Gödelian inexhaustibility that you can keep extending your theory forever, right? And you'll never reach the, the complete theory. Um, you know, if you want a recursive set of axioms and all that, um, possibility semantics can give you a model of that, which possible world semantics can't. Now, there's also um, an arithmetic interpretation of this idea of some theory in the group knows. So for that, you would actually need to talk about a, having a class of theories and an arithmetically definable class of theories and a predicate that can define uh, membership in that class. That can all be worked out, but I see that I'm out of time. So let me get to my conclusion slide. I, I'm happy to talk about how this idea of provability logic with, with someone proves what the arithmetic interpretation of that is. Um, and under that arithmetic interpretation, I should say, we get the arithmetic validity of if P, if P then some theory in the class proves P. Okay, so there are some details on that. But what I really wanna ask I hope I've given at least the flavor of what I mean by provability logic plus the modality some theory proves. And I wonder, I just wanna leave everybody with this question, um, can this be systematically developed? Can this idea of provability logic with some theory proved, does that have a future uh, for research? Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for such a lucid talk. It, it was really nice and motivating. And I would like to ask uh, the audience whether they do have questions. Any question? Yeah, Jam, uh, please continue. I'm back again. Yeah. So I have actually many questions here. Yeah. Thanks very much for such a thought provoking talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, questions one is on, uh, uh, well, the Gödel problem will take some time to sink, but uh, sink in. But even on the basic uh, definitions, uh, is there some connection to filter spaces here? Because uh, uh, there seem to be some kind of filters in the background, and I'm not able to put my finger on it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, sorry, it's a vague question. I know. But, uh, no, 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 no. It's a great question. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. Um, well, the, the choice-free stone duality that I mentioned yeah. um, is based on filters instead of ultra filters. Oh, okay. So what we do is we topologize the set of filters. Uh, and then we, we, we realize that the, the resulting space, um, if you look at the compact open, regular open set in this space on the set of filters, that gives you back your original Boolean algebra. Oh, so, but you're absolutely right that you know, I didn't talk about the topological duality, but when you talk about topological duality, wherever you would use ultra filters in the standard theory, you're using filters and possibility semantics. Okay. Yeah. So because you said atomic and here complete. So that was the natural question. So yeah, that's a very nice and uh, very pretty connection then I would say. Yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, when you have the, when we work with these partial orders, uh, what kind of correspondence theory do we get? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So it turns out every Solquist formula um, has a first order correspondent. 
But now, but now in the language, you know, you got to have a first order language with R and and uh, the yes. version, of course. Both, yeah. Both of them. Yeah. So one of my students, Kentaro Yamamoto, um, has a paper on. I think it's called maybe correspondence theory for possibility semantics. If you Google that, you you get the the paper that does the Salkvist theorem. And that's actually been generalized uh, even further by Zhao um, uh, to like inductive formulas or something. A uh, very general class of formulas that have first order correspondence. Um, last thing is about uh, varying agent uh, domains. Uh, yes. I've seen similar things in term model logics. In term model logics as well, when you have uh, you know, variables indexing modalities, again, you can have varying agent uh, uh, perspective. And uh, I remember reading something by Mel Fitting who also talks about general propositions and so on, but I don't remember now very well. Uh, I don't know, there is more correspondence. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So in, the, in this chapter, which I'd be happy to send you. <laughs> yeah, I um, certainly want to. Okay, awesome. I'll definitely do that. So in this chapter, I talk about a more expressive language than just the language with S. So I had the language with some theory proved, but I, I do consider this fitting approach of what's called term modal logic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there we can quantify, we can say there exists an X such that box XP. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a more expressive formalism in which you could also think about provability term modal provability logic. Okay. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, so I'm saying it. Thank you. Any more question? Okay. If, if not, then I have some like very bad questions actually. So when I was just uh, uh, like looking at those slides, it reminds me about the Prince algebra and the proximity space and all. So is there any uh, uh, possibility to do work on the Prince algebra instead of uh, Boolean algebra only? Uh, so, because you were working with those relation and the set and so in proximity, I mean, in the Prince algebra, they do have Boolean algebra together with proximity relation and all. So is there any connection with this kind of things? Yes, definitely. Yeah, so that's right. So in this, um, yeah, like I think often they take regular opens and, they de and then they define uh, some proximity relation on the regular opens, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think that's definitely related. Uh, in fact, it's probably worth somebody working on the connection between that and what we've done in possibility semantics. I, I, mean, I remember sitting in on a number of talks where they're talking about, um, you know, logics of region based space and stuff like that and where they look at regular opens. I mean, this all, yeah, there's, a, there's a long history of like, going all the way back to Tarski, um, thinking about muriology and regions and regular opens. It's all kind of mixed together. Uh, it's actually kind of cool that th this, this regular open perspective, it happens there, it happens in forcing, a lot of different areas that converge on this kind of structure. So I, I would like to learn more about it myself. Uh, so I'll, I'll put that on the agenda. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, I hope that there is no question because no one is asking. No? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the chat, I would definitely be happy to send the, the chapter on possibility semantics. Yeah. Um, I think I've asked too many questions, maybe. Can I ask one more? Oh, sure, why not? Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is a very uh, philosophical kind of remark. I mean, the possibilities could be quite wild, right? I mean, uh, is there a way to, for instance, say that I'm going to restrict myself to computable ones, for instance, or some restriction which is uh, mathematical of that kind? I mean, uh, uh, so because, uh, you know, there has to be some effort in discovering the possibility. Yes. Uh, so if I restrict them to computable sets, for instance, would I get some semantics that is? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, um, 
Yeah, there's a paper by a, a former Berkeley student, Matthew Harrison Trainer, which is called, uh, I gotta remember, First Order Possibility Semantics and Finitary Completeness Proofs, I think it's called. I'll just, yeah. Um, Harrison Trainer, and that discusses the idea of computable possibilities. Okay. Uh -huh. So it actually wants to ask whether you could give a completeness proof for um, first order possibility semantics, okay. in which all of the possibilities are taken to be computable. So I think so, that addresses my question. Oh, yeah. So does it mean that in the propositional case, they will be computable in the sense that uh, you have some uh, canonical model from which you can get drawn from this? Yeah? Yes, indeed. So. Um, the way I actually got started on this was in 2004, uh, 2014, sorry, 2014, in an ad advances in modal logic paper, which was called, uh, part, I didn't list it here, but it's called partiality and adjointness in modal logic. Partiality and adjointness. Um, what that paper does actually is it does canonical model constructions in which the, um, the, the, the world, the possibilities, excuse me, are just finite. <laughs> so it's just like a single formula. Okay, okay. Yeah. But we can definitely do that in the propositional case. At least for some, for at least for some logic. Mm. Uh, that, 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 that paper didn't cover all logic, but just for some standard logics, uh, you could have that, that kind of completeness proof, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for answering all those questions in a nice way. And I'm sorry that you had to wake up that early. <laughs> oh, it was a pleasure. No, this was really fun. I really appreciate everybody staying up a little bit later <laughs> in the workday to uh, hear the talk. This was really great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. So we are concluding our uh, talk for today. Yeah, could you please send the slide to us so that we can just upload it on our website? Yes, definitely.